Okay, so I'm going to get started. Um, and what I'd like to do today is to go over how we could create online assessments and quizzes and exams um, using Blackboard. And just to go over what I covered last workshop, which was on Wednesday, which if you missed, um, there will be a video posted of the workshop. And let me just make sure I'm recording this one. OK. And I started working with, let's see, was this class right here, Programming for Analytics? This is the online version. Uh, I'll be teaching this online. It was initially going to be face to face, which is why I have two. Uh, but this is the one that I'm going to be using. And last week, I briefly went over how you could copy a uh, course, uh, previous course into your into your new course, uh, which I did, and then showed how you could integrate your uh, third party learning platform. Mine's called MindTap. Right? It's by Cengage. So I went ahead and created the course, and then put a what they call a deep link um, from my Blackboard shell to that course. So when I click on it. It opens up the uh, MindTap course, and this will work for all students. They just click the link; it will open the MindTap uh, platform, and they don't even have to log into it. It's just a single sign-on. Okay. And then I showed how we could add some assignments. Right. So, for instance, all of my homework assignments are using MindTap. So I went ahead and put some deep links into uh, my, uh, into Blackboard that will link to the MindTap assignment. So instead of taking you to that welcome screen, I just showed you in MindTap, if they click on an exercise here from Blackboard, it will take them right into that exercise in MindTap. So what's nice here is they're using two systems, but it sort of looks as if they're just using Blackboard is they click on an assignment in Blackboard and it opens this up, this one up right away. OK, so even though I have two different systems here, I integrate it. So it just makes it easier for the students and more manageable for them to work with the two systems. Now, um, and then I showed how you could uh, synchronize the assignments with the Blackboard gradebook. And um, I did have to, even though I copied my course from a previous course, I did have to reestablish those links. So um, I went ahead and did that. Oh, can you make it possible? OK. Um, I can't, uh, Diane, but you can. Uh, I don't know if you can see this on my, I'm actually sharing the, um, I'm sharing the collaborate screen here. There is a button right here where it says show view controls. And if you click on that, you can actually zoom in and make it bigger on your end. Let me know if that works for you. OK, yep. And then this way you can zoom. I mean, technically, I can zoom also, but I'd have to change my resolution, um, which sometimes messes things up. So I always tell the students, go ahead and, and maximize on your side. And if, if you have trouble with that, then I can make it bigger. But this usually works out pretty well. OK. All right. So, um, so if we go into the grade book, the grade center, all of the assignments that I added right, were automatically, well, there was a checkbox when I imported it that said add to grade book. So then they were added to the grade book here. And then I also showed how I can make a homework average uh, column, which what that did is um, I, I created a category called homework. All of the programming exercises that are homework assignments, I designated as the part of the homework category. And then I was able to, from my homework average column, just go ahead and select the uh, homework category here on the left, which is missing because I already carried it over. Um, and then you can drop the lowest grade 
right? Drop the highest grade or, you know, do different things with, with this uh, particular column. It makes it a lot easier. And then I also had a course average um, column, which shows the course average. And this is a weighted column. So what I did was, and I think when I was demonstrating this, I actually brought over the homework category, uh, which you could do, but another way of doing it is since I already had a homework average column, I just went ahead and copied that over and changed it to 30% because homeworks are 30% uh, as part of the grading scale for my course, okay? Okay, so this is all well and good if all the assignments are coming from MindTap, but you may have assignments that you uh, schedule and assign from Blackboard. Maybe you don't have a third-party learning platform you use. And I will also show how not all of my assignments are actually can be submitted through MindTap. So I do have to create some Blackboard assignments. And all of my quizzes and exams are also from Blackboard. So I'll show how to do that as well. Um, the first thing I want to show, though, is how to set up a discussion board. This I wasn't originally going to go over this, but uh, some of you in the survey mentioned that you would like some instruction on how to create a discussion board, so I'll show that. Uh, another thing I want to show very quickly is I have all these links on the left-hand side, but it's kind of difficult to navigate right now because they're all just kind of listed there. And if you wanted to break up, let's say, the weekly modules from these other links, I can show you a nice way of doing that. Um, if you click this plus sign up here, or just hover over it, this is what we used to create our content area last workshop. If you select, come down here and select divider, gives you a little line here at the bottom. And what you could do is click and drag this line to separate the uh, menu entries here on the left. So if I wanna, let's say, separate out my weekly modules, I just put the divider here above week one and I'm gonna do the same thing below week 15, okay? So that, and so this is kind of a nice feature of, of Blackboard. You can use these dividers just to make it look a little more cleaner. Okay, on week one, I, I don't have anything in week one only because I'm, I'm counting week one as the week of the uh, August 13th and 14th, which are the first days of class if you teach a uh, Tuesday, Thursday, or, or Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. So I don't have anything here right now. I am gonna include some things for that Friday that we meet, but I'm gonna use this content area just to quickly show how I create discussion boards. Now, uh, again, I don't typically use discussion boards in my undergraduate courses just because I, my classes are synchronous and we meet so many times a week in real time using Collaborate. Um, I do use the discussion boards, however, when I teach the graduate level, because even though we do have meetings, they're only once per week, and they're usually with question and answer type of meetings. Um, they're more, uh, they have to basically go over the material themselves before, before we meet. So I do have a discussion board, and I do weekly discussion boards for that class. Um, but, I'm going to go back very quickly to my programming for analytics section one. Now, this is the one I'm not using. Um, but the reason I'm going back to it is because it has all of these default categories here on the left. Now, I deleted these um, when I copied over my previous course because I didn't need them. Um, but there is one here called discussions. So they basically what they did is they created a discussion board um, before you actually get your course shell. And you can use this if you want to have all your discussions in one place. Okay. And what you could do is you can create a forum. So it has a button here to create a forum. So if you have individual topics that you would like to put on your discussion board, you can go ahead and create a forum for that. And you can set a date if you want to uh, show it on a certain date and then, and then um, turn it off after a certain date. Okay, so you have starting and end dates there and a few other uh, options here. If you wanted to grade them and put them on the, uh, uh, the grade book, you can do that as well, right? So I'll go ahead and submit this. And this is topic one and that's it. So now it's automatically set up. And what you can do is you can now click in it and create a thread. 
And then you can go ahead and type in a question if you wanted. Submit that. And then students can come on here and click on it, and they could reply. Right. And they can put in their answers. Okay. And, and that's pretty much how you would set up the discussion board if you were going to use that discussion content area in Blackboard. Um, but the thing is, they would always have to go to that tab if they wanted to participate in the discussion. If you wanted to do it more like the way I did it in my graduate course, do like a week by week, what you can do is inside of your weekly module, click on tools and select discussion board from here. Okay. And then we can just click next for now. Okay. And we can call it, okay, discussion board's fine. I'll just call this week one discussion board. Click submit. And here's the week one discussion board. So you can actually include this with, now I don't have anything in week one, but if I wanted to put it in week two, I can have a little link down here that says week two discussion board. And then you click in that, and now it looks the same exact way as it did when it was a tab in my course shell. And you can create your forum and then work on it from here. And that's basically it. So again, if you want them all to go to one place, keep the discussion tab that they give you in Blackboard. If you'd rather um, have a discussion board for each week, then what you can do is use the tools tab at the top of your content area, and then just click on discussion board and create it that way. And that's it. I, I generally like to put everything in my weekly modules because that's the place that the student goes to and has everything right there. Um, there are certain things I can't put in my weekly modules, such as my Blackboard Collaborate sessions. Um, uh, Zoom sessions can also not be put into the weekly modules. So you may want to have, and I'll show how to do this in next week's workshop, but you may want to have a, a link at the side on the side that has, you know, um, class meetings or, or what, it, what have you and have them go into there for that. Uh, otherwise, I really like to put everything in my in my weekly modules if I can. OK. OK, so as I mentioned, um, what I like to do is bring in the assignments from MindTap for homework. OK, and if they click on it, what they're going to do is work on these programs from for homework. And what's nice about MindTap, any of you that use Engage MindTap, you may know that a lot of the online activities give um, real-time feedback to the student so they know if they're kind of doing it correctly or not. And uh, that's one of the features of my class here. This is my uh, programming class, Programming for Analytics. And basically what they have is they, they have the instructions here on the left, they type in their code here on the right, and then they can run their code. And if they, before they submit it to me, they can go into this task um, list here and check if uh, check each task to see, see if the program's running correctly. So in other words, they get feedback from the system to know, is it working right? Do they actually submit it to me? And when they start checking these, the submit button down here at the bottom is going to increase in percentages. So what they would, the goal is to get 100% here, submit it, and then it gets submitted to me and gets put into Blackboard right away with 100%. Um, but even if they don't get 100, they may get partial percentage here, and they can click and submit that. Okay. But sometimes, like for instance, program exercise 5.10. Sometimes they don't get that submit button. And there's various reasons for that. Um, for this particular program, uh, which is a, a text analysis program, um, there's a lot of different types of output that could be returned to the user. And usually the way that this works is it compares the outputs, the outputs that, it, that it's expecting with the output that the program's generating. And because this particular program can have different outputs depending on what the user inputs, 
there's no way to grade it. So it says you will not be graded on this lab. Okay, so MindTap does not grade this, but I really like this program, so I like to give it to students. So what I need to do then is I have to go into Blackboard and I have to create uh, an assignment that they can then take their code and paste it into, into Blackboard, or maybe paste it into a Word doc and submit that Word doc into Blackboard, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna create an assignment. And the way I do that is I'm gonna come right here to my content area and I'm going to click on the uh, hover over the assessments tab here on the right. And then I'm going to click on assignment. Okay. And I believe this was exercise 5.10. So I'm going to put that in here. Okay. So that's the name. And here you can put the instructions. So the instructions I'm going to put here is please submit your code for exercise 5.10, um, I'll put as a Word document. Okay. Now, if your assignment has some files that you'd like them to work with and start with, you can go ahead and attach files, but you don't have to. This is the due date. So this is the date that uh, I'd like the assignment to be due. So let me go into my schedule here just to see when I have that due. Okay, that's due on 11.1. So I'll go back into Blackboard here and I will put November 1st. Okay. And uh, you want to select end of day. Do not select midnight. Midnight is the beginning of the day. So you want to come down here and put end of day, okay, which will be 11.59 p.m. The points available, this is going to be worth 100 points. You can add a rubric if you want. Um, you can select one if you already have one saved. You can create a new one. And they give you this um, little rubric here at the bottom that you can fill out if you want to. Okay, I'm not going to use a rubric. Uh, here are some submission details. This is the assignment type. This is an individual submission. All of my assignments are individual submissions. If they work in a group, you can do a group submission. Um, but you do have to define the groups first, which you can do in that the shell that they give you by default does have a tab called groups. You can click in there and create your groups that way. Um, I don't use groups, but if you do, and if there's anything that I'm mentioning here that I don't use, you would like some instruction on that. If you want to contact me offline, I'll be happy to work with you on it. Even though I don't use it, I could probably help you uh, figure it out. Um, and then there's portfolio submissions if you do portfolio submissions. But this is a single submission. Um, number of attempts, since this is a homework, um, you can do multiple attempts or unlimited. If you do multiple, you can specify any attempts they want. I'm going to do unlimited. I don't care if they keep submitting it as long as they have it by the due date. And then score attempts using the last graded attempt, or if you want to do the highest or lowest grade, you can do that. If it's a written assignment like an essay, you can check for plagiarism using SafeAssign, and this will run it through a database of submissions to see if they took it from another source. Um, okay, grading options. This is when you grade it. Do you want it to be anonymous grading so you don't see the student name? Um, enable delegated grading, one or more additional grader. So if it's more than you grading it, I guess you can click that. Again, I don't, I don't use, do anything with that option. And then here is how you're gonna display the grade. You wanna display it as a score, right? I'm giving it 100 points, so it'll show as 100 if they got 100, but if you wanna do more of a percentage, you can do that as well, or you can make it a letter grade, right? There's a primary and secondary. It says the secondary is displayed in the grade center only, so if you wanna display it differently to the student in the grade center, you can do that, okay? Including grade center calculations, of course, that's already checked. Show to students in my grade, so they see it in their grade book, check that. And then this one is unchecked, show average statistics, and I never show that. 
Okay, so really the only thing I did here is I went ahead and made this on limited attempts. Um, didn't really change anything else. Okay, make the assignment available. This is when you want to actually show the assignment. Now, this is important for Blackboard assignments. Um, sometimes, right, you think, okay, well, I'm going to put a due date in here of 11-1 at 1159. This means I can't submit it after this date. Um, that's actually not true. And this is one of the flaws with the assignments in Blackboard. If you put a due date, students can still submit it after the due date. And what you'll see is a little indicator in your grade book saying that this student submitted it late. And I don't like that because then it's kind of like, well, you know, if I have it due at 1159 and then they submit it at one in the morning, do I penalize them for the hour? You know, so so basically what I like to do is I only display it until the due date. So this way it will disappear from Blackboard if they don't have it in by the due date and um, they have to submit it by 1159. Okay, the display after is if you want to set it to open at a certain time, but I don't care if it's display C. Um, well, maybe I, maybe I will change this. So that week starts, I mean, I basically hide the tab anyway, so um, yeah, I'll just leave this unchecked for now. And then track number of views. This is a way you can see if they actually went in and and looked at it. Okay, so we'll go ahead and submit that. Okay, so here it is, exercise 510. I'm still going to keep this link so they can at least link, click in it to go into it and work on it, but then I'll let them know, make sure you submit it here. Um, what I do need to do though is in my grade center, I'm going to go to programming exercise 510. Okay, now I named it differently on purpose. This is programming exercise 510. That's the one that's from MindTap, which is not going to be graded. So I'm going to delete this from my um, grade center here. So, oh, maybe I delete it. I could hide it though. Yeah, probably be, I have probably have to delete the actual assignment for it to be removed from here. Okay, so I can hide it, I guess. So then this way it's not shown. So you can always hide it. And then let me see if I can find the new one. So the new one's going to show up at the end here. That's exercise 510. So there's a few things I want to do. I want to go into my manage column organization. This is what I showed last week. Or I'm sorry, on Wednesday. So column organization, here it is down here. I want to move it up so it's more with the uh, exercises. So I'm going to drag it and I'll put it right here. Okay. It is an assignment. I want to make it a homework because I want it to be part of the homework category, which gets averaged in with all the homework assignments. So I'm going to check, a, check it here. And I'm going to change category to homework. Okay. And then click submit. Oh, by the way, the due dates, notice I do have a due date here um, for this one. The other ones don't have any due dates. I haven't set up the due dates yet. And now the due dates, if you're using a third party like I am, like MindTap, you want to set up the due dates in MindTap, right, or MyLab or whatever you use. Um, they will still show up as none in Blackboard. So the due dates, at least for Cengage MindTap, do not carry over into Blackboard. So just keep that in mind. So if you went ahead and made the due date in MindTap a certain day and then you come into Blackboard, you see it says none, it will still be due on the date in MindTap. It will just show none here in Blackboard, right? Um, okay, so I'm gonna ahead and submit that. Okay. And that's it for, for creating the uh, assignments, okay? Okay, uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to create a quiz. So, so each week I have, oh, let me show you another thing. I'm sorry, because one question that came up last workshop was 
if you have a lot of assignments or exercises like I do, um, that gradebook can get a bit big, right? And it's hard to manage. And that's true. Um, one of the ways that I find it can make it a little bit easier to work with is you can change the view of the grade center. If you click up here and you say turn on screen reader mode, it makes it a lot easier to read um, and work with. So that's, if it gets really big, I mean, changing it to this, you could see it, it scrolls a lot quicker. It doesn't bounce around as I'm scrolling from left to right. Um, so that's one, one way you can, you can make it a little easier, a little easier to work with. Another thing is I don't want the um, in-class assignments because there's so many in-class assignments um, to go into the grade book. So, but I still want them to be graded for it. So what I do is I create a uh, assignment for each class, each lecture, right? So every day we have class, I create an assignment for that. So what I do is I go into my in class assignments folder and I go ahead and create. Now, I actually don't call it an assignment and there's a reason for that. I call it a test. Okay, and I'll explain why, but I create a test. Now it's not technically a test. It's only like I mentioned in my grading scale on Wednesday, the in-class assignments are 10%, right? Which, and there's so many, every day there's an in-class assignment. So if a student's sick one day, or even if they're sick two days, I think it really takes about three in-class assignments to lose a point off of the average. Okay, so they can be sick a few times, it's not gonna make or break their grade. Right, but I call it a test, and I'll tell you why in a second here. And all my tests are here. You can see I have all my lectures from the summer. And that's because I copied them over from a previous um, uh, class. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and let me create a new one just for demonstration purposes. And I'll call this um, Chapter 1, Lecture 1. And I'm going to click Submit. OK. And this is, by the way, how you would create any test. So even though this is an in-class assignment for me, you can create your test this way too. OK. So here's where you can create your question. Now, this is if you're creating a test from scratch. OK. So they have all different types of questions here that you can use. OK. So if you're doing a multiple choice, uh, you can select multiple choice. If you're doing multiple answers, select that. Fill in the, has fill in the blanks. Fill in multiple blanks. Um, they have essay questions, and this is what I'm actually going to use here. Okay, they have true false, right? So I'm going to use essay, and I do this for every class. And on and my essay question now, and then it takes me to this page. I can put in my question text. I'm just going to say. Submit your code from today's lecture. And that's it. Okay, and again, you can do rubrics here, um, work with different categories and keywords. I usually don't touch that. Um, if you have an answer, you can put it here. Now, the answer doesn't necessarily mean the student will see the answer. Um, sometimes it helps if you're grading if you can see their answer and then at the bottom you see your answer the correct answer okay so like for instance if i'm if i'm grading someone's code and and i don't do it here for the in class but i'll show you from my actual quizzes i do this i like to put the correct answer there and i compare their answer with the correct answer and if i need to um but there's also an option where you say you know show the answer to the student or don't show the answer to the student i never show the answer to the student only because you know you may be using this every semester and you don't want the student to be able to collect answers and then put it online or give it to students taking the class the following semester. So I never give the answer or show the answer to the student. I always just give my own feedback. Um, but anyway, this again, this is just an in class. I say submit your code from today's lecture and I click submit. If you had another question, you can say submit and create another. Okay, I'm just gonna hit submit, okay. And then here's my question here. Okay, now by default, this is total points 10. I'm gonna make this 100. Go ahead and change this. 
and then I'm going to click OK. Okay, now here, now it's going to come to all of the tests that I have. I'm going to add Chapter 1, Lecture 1, and hit Submit. Okay. And then they have all these different options here, okay, pertaining to your test. Do you want to open the test in a new window? I never do. I just, when they click on the test, it opens them in, in the Blackboard window that they're currently in. Make available to students, I say yes. Okay, this doesn't mean they're going to see it because you can still control when they see it by the starting and end dates, which I'll show in a bit. Add a new announcement for a test. I don't add announcements. I say no. Multiple attempts. Um, I don't really allow multiple attempts. I guess I could since it is just an in-class assignment. Um, but usually students don't have any issue just submitting their code and hitting the submit. They don't need multiple attempts. Force completion for in-class assignments, I do not force completion because, again, it's just a copy and paste. They hit submit and that's it. They're not timed or anything. I don't set the timer either. I do do this for my quizzes, so I will show you how I do this for quizzes, but for my in-class, I don't do that. Uh, display after and display until, I do use this, okay? Now, some folks have asked, and I saw this in the listserv, they're very concerned with the online lectures because they say if I'm using Blackboard Collaborator or I'm using Zoom and I choose the option to record my lecture, then what happens if no one comes to class? Because then they're just going to watch the recording. And that's true. That is a problem. That's a problem I have during the summer. I have that problem during the summer because I, in the summer, um, the schedule does not have a specific day and meeting time. OK, so and then I also get students telling me that they work during the summer and they couldn't, you know, attend the class at this hour. So in the summer, I do not um, have the students. I do meet every day. I get some students that come to the lecture, but then there are some that decide I'm just going to watch the recording. And I can tell you the ones that watch the recording um, usually don't do as well as the ones that are in class. OK. But the nice thing about the fall and the spring semesters is we do have times that we meet, okay? So when we went online last semester, I told all my students, I said, listen, you still have to come to class during the time that we meet because obviously you don't have a job that's conflicting with this time, like I get told in the summer. So, um, so what I do is I keep this assignment open only during class time. Okay, so this is, you know, chapter one, lecture one, which on my syllabus, I know I'm going to hold on uh, 819. Okay, so on the 19th is when we're going to hold this lecture. So I'll go ahead and say display after 819, uh, August 19th. Okay, now this class meets... Uh, I think it's in the afternoon, so I'm just going to go with what I think, and then we can I can change it later. Actually, I can look on my syllabus. Okay, this one. Oh, I didn't put the class hours because I thought we were adjusting them. Okay, I want to say it's probably 1:30 to 2:20. Okay, so 8:19. And I'll select 2.30 because that's all it has. But you can go in and change this to 2.20. OK. Now, again, you can do this on the, on the regular assignment too, right? The one that I just showed. So if you wanted to make this a regular assignment and only set the time during class, so this way they have to submit it during class, you can do that. But then you have the issue of, well, what if they decide they don't want to come to class? Right. Um, but they're just going to go in and, and just do it during during the lecture time and they'll do, do it on their own. They just they don't want to bother sitting sitting in class. So how do you make sure they actually attend the class? And that's where this comes in. And this is the reason why I use tests for my in class assignments. And I do this not only online, I also do it in the classroom as well. If you set a password and you can't set a password for an assignment, it has to be a test. So if you set a password, this right, 
make sure the student comes to class because they're going to need this password to submit the assignment. Now, I still take attendance at the beginning of class. So there have been times where I get a student that wasn't there that still submitted the assignment because somebody sent them the password that was in class. Okay, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So I still take attendance and I tell them, you know, if you submit an assignment, but you are not present in class, you still do not get credit. Okay, so again, this is not a foolproof here, but, but again, it does work somewhat. And my password is usually just some kind of you know, six digit number. Okay. And then the due date. Okay, so the due date I make also right the end of class. So I'll make this 819. at 220. And this says do not allow students to start the test if the due date has passed. Um, I'm going to check this. I don't check it for my quizzes, but I do check it for my in-class assignments. The reason I don't check it for my quizzes is because I do allow a student to make up a quiz if um, if they couldn't take the quiz for one reason or another. Uh, and then usually I say, well, you know, if you were sick that day and if you have some sort of documentation or or some of us, you know, we have athletes in our class and they can't come to class that day because the travel letter says that they're traveling. Um, I do allow them to take it afterwards. So for a quiz, I don't check this, but for in class, um, I don't do makeup for make in class assignments, so I check it. Okay. All right. And then I come, then there are a few more options, self-assessment options. I don't click anything there. And then it comes down to the feedback. Now, um, as I mentioned, right, what I do is um, I don't like all any student to see their grade until I grade them all. So I show them the feedback after all attempts are graded. This is important, especially during the quizzes, because um, if you do have someone that couldn't take the quiz, you don't want another student to who've already taken it say hey here's the feedback you gave me this is you know even though i don't give the answers i still give feedback on how to get the answer which could help so i usually don't show the grades or the feedback until after all attempts are graded okay i show the score per question okay now here are the answers okay this is what i was talking about where when you create the question and you put the answer in there, if you check on the correct checkbox here, this means they're gonna see the correct answer, the one that you put in the question. I never check that, okay? Instead, what I do is I only check the submitted answers. These are the answers that they submitted, okay? So they see their answer that they submitted. Um, I always check feedback. Okay, which means that they're going to see my feedback. So that's important too. And then showing correct answers. It says, you know, does it show that it's correct or incorrect? Again, if it's incorrect, I show feedback. If it's correct, they don't get any feedback. They also see the amount of points they get per question. This one's not as important, but if you want, you can check it. Okay. Test presentation. Okay. Now, has one question but if you have a quiz that has multiple questions you can do all at once you could do one at a time you can also do prohibit backtracking so they can't go back to previous questions I do all at once um, if you like to do one at a time which is actually my preference I would prefer to show one question at a time and I used to do that but there's actually an issue with Respond is lockdown browser, which I'm going to talk about next workshop, where if you do one at a time, it sometimes hangs up as they go from question to question. So because of that issue with the lockdown browser, I just choose all at once. Now, an in-class assignment only has one question. It's not a big deal. But even in my quizzes, I, I show all at once. So they see all the questions at one time. Then here's randomize. So if you have multiple questions and you want to randomize it, right? Uh, so the students get the questions that you know, in a different order, you can do that. Okay, again, this only has one question, so 
I don't check that. Okay, and then I hit submit. Okay, and let me let me go ahead and grab this password. Okay. And then we hit submit. Okay. So in class then what I do is I go over some exercises in class. Some of them they do on their own. And now again, we don't do all of these in one class. This is over the span of two weeks, right? This is weeks two and three. But but I do create in the in-class assignments folder a um, an assignment called chapter one, lecture one, if that's the one we're on. And I say, okay, then they go in, they click begin. I give them the password, okay? So they put it in there and just make sure that they're in class, they get the password. They click submit. now. What happens if they're watching the recording? Well, if they're watching the recording, if they miss class that day, this lecture assignment isn't shown, so they can't submit it. And even if I did show it, right, they wouldn't be able to submit it because I had a due date that I was at the end of the class. Okay. So we hit submit. Okay, and then what they do is they come in here and they just submit the code from the lecture. They click save and submit. It goes through. Okay. And then what happens is it, every day, now this again, this is a lot of time if you do it this way, right? But again, it's 10%. It's, it's I don't spend too much time grading these. Um, I just, and we only work on a few problems per day and they're short programs. So it doesn't really take me much time to just go through just to make sure that they're they're submitting their their code is similar to the code that I may have demonstrated in class or something that we they may have done on their own and we reviewed at the end of class just to see if they're doing the right thing. Sometimes I'll get students that'll submit one out of three exercises we worked on that day, and I know that they sleep during the class. And I'll deduct, you know. You know, half credit will get 50% maybe. And I'll say, you know, you, you missed, you didn't submit these two questions. So then they know, okay, I better go in and pay attention and submit everything we're going over in class. So it is kind of hand holding, I know, but especially a class like this, it, the work can get pretty complex over time. So, okay. So here's my after one lecture one. And then what happens is any time that a student submitted it, it shows, you know, that their work needs to be graded here. And then I go into it and I make sure. And, and you know, I, again, I, I'm not too strict with the in-class assignments. If they got, you know, got it most, most of the work submitted, maybe they missed a little thing here or there. You know, they'll get a 95 out of 100. And the reason I take off a few points is because I want them, I want to, you know, them to, to know that they missed some things and they have to go in and read my feedback. Okay, so again, so that's how I handle my, my, my in-class assessments. Okay. And that's the reason I make it a test. Now keep in mind that when they do click on it, it's gonna say test. And I do tell them, I know it says test, but it's not really a test. It is just an in-class assignment. Okay, so let's now let's talk about an actual quiz. Okay, so when I build my quizzes, I do it the same way. I go to assessments, test, okay, and um, I'll just create a sample quiz here. I'll just call it um, quiz one. Okay, and hit submit. Okay, now this is the same screen I showed before. So for my quizzes, I actually like to um, give uh, all essay questions. And it's not in this class, they're not really essays. They're more coding assignments. Um, but the essay gives them the space where they can copy and paste their code. So <clears throat> you could create a question from scratch, or you could reuse a question. OK. Now, I always review, reuse questions. And I create uh, question blocks, okay? Or I, I, I create a, a pool, what I, what I call a pool of questions, okay? And I'll show you how I do that. So before, I'm, before I put any questions in here, I'm gonna go ahead and create a pool. Now, the way we do that is, 
not sure if you can do it from this screen. Um, let's see. Create random block. Yeah, here's all my pools. So I, th I think you're going to have to create the pool beforehand. So here's all my pool of questions. But if you don't have pools, if you go to course tools and go down to test surveys and pools, okay, and then click on pools, you can create a pool of questions. So here's all of my pools here. But I'm going to go ahead and create a pool just so you see how to do it. So I'm going to build a pool. Now, with a pool of questions, what you can do is you can select a question at random. So what I do is if I have, let's say, a chapter one question one pool, I can create, let's say, three question ones and select a question at random. So this way, all my students don't get the same question. OK, and, and you have to be careful, especially in the online format. Because if students are taking these at home, right? Now I'm going to show the Respondus browser next workshop. But let's say you don't use Respondus. You know, what's stopping them from, you know, texting their friend or calling their friend saying, hey, what what'd you get for this answer? So if you have a pool of questions, they'll all hopefully get different questions. And they won't be able to cheat off of one another. OK, so I'm going to call this chapter one, question one. I'm going to hit submit, OK? And now you can create the type of question you want. So again, I always give essays. So I'm going to say create question essay. And I'm going to say this is question one. And say one. So this is where you would put your, your question. This is question one and say one. And then I'm going to say submit and create another. I'm going to say this is question one. That's a two. And then create another. This is question one. That's a three. And now I'm going to hit submit. So I have my three questions. OK. So here's my pool of questions here, OK? And that's it. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to say OK. OK, so here's the pool. So now what I can do is go back to my quiz, OK? And I have to start to create it again because I didn't go through with it. And I called it quiz one. OK, now because, OK, I'm going to have to go in and build it. Basically, what it does is because I stopped it, it's just bringing me to the quiz settings before I can create any questions. And I'll have to create the questions after the fact. Um, let me do this. Oh, OK, that's fine. All right, so here it is. So now I can say edit the test. OK, so this is the screen it took me to when I was creating it to begin with. There's no questions. I'm going to say review, reuse questions, and I'm going to say create random block. Now, if you create a random set, what this will do is it will ask all the questions in the pool. OK. But I always create a random block. So this way, and then I click, select chapter one, question one, and I go down here. I say all pool questions. Here they all are. And then I hit submit. And now what it's telling me is there's three questions in this block, but it's only going to display one of the questions. And then you can put the amount of points you want. So if you want it to be 25 points, that's it. And then you can reuse question, create another random block, right? However many questions you have. What I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to create my quiz one. So I'm going to delete this one. Click OK. All right. And I'm going to create a random block. And I'm going to use my actual pool. So here's all my pools of questions. Now, I mix chapter my chapter one and chapter two. There's not much in my chapter one. And it's very similar to my chapter two. So I basically just called it chapter two. I have a pool called chapter two, question one. 
I'm going to say all pull questions. Okay, so this is the pool I created before. I can preview the questions here. Okay, and here's all my questions. Now, all of these are very similar questions. Okay, and here's the answer. I do put the answer in there, but again, students don't see this unless you click that checkbox in the settings. But you can see they're all very similar. They all accept input, they all do some type of processing, and they all output, right? But they're different enough, whereas you know, they can't really copy from each other, okay? So it asks the same type of thing, but just a little bit different enough so they don't copy from one another. And then you can put the total points here. I usually put three questions, so I say 33.3. They can still get 100 if they get a 99.9, .9, but okay, so there's the first one. And then I'll go ahead and create another random block. This time, question two. All pool questions. Submit. Okay. And then I'll create a third. Now there's three questions on this quiz. I used to give four, but I got some complaints that students said they didn't have enough time to do four. My question, my classes are 50 minutes only. So I now give three, okay? And I click okay. All right, so here's quiz one. And now, now if you were building the quiz uh, from scratch, it would actually take you to that settings page. Um, I'm going to go ahead and edit the test options. This will take me back to it. And this is what I was showing before, right? Open the test in a new window. No. Make available to students. Yes. Um, okay. Multiple attempts I don't give. I do force completion because it says that once they start it, it has to be completed in one sitting. Okay. So. Now, the problem with the force completion is if you're doing an online class and let's say their computer crashes, um, their quiz is going to be submitted. Okay, so if you want to go in and you know, boot up the computer and start the quiz again and, and continue where they left off, don't check this. Okay, I do check it because I use Respondus and Usually, you know, the computer doesn't crash. Um, if there's an internet issue, Respondus will show me the internet issue. And I do force completion. Now, even though it gets, because what tends to happen is if you use a Respondus lockdown browser, the student may say, you know what, I, I, really, I really need to look at an outside source here. So I'm gonna go ahead and shut down my computer. I'm gonna pretend that the quiz crashed I'm going to now look for the answer, and then I'm going to tell my professor, hey, it crashed. Can I go back into it? OK, so that does happen. So I do force completion. Now, what force completion means is they come to me and say, Dr. Sauce, my computer crashed. And um, I submitted it. I can't go back into the quiz. And I say, no problem. I go in, I remove the quiz, and I say, go ahead, go back into the quiz. But what happens is, because I do random questions, they probably will get a different quiz the second time around, okay? Now the questions will be similar enough where if they understand it well enough, then they're not gonna have a problem answering my variation of the question. So I do tell them, look, quiz may be a little bit different, but yes, you can retake it and then that's it. If, they, if they're comfortable with the material and the computer really did crash, they'll have no problem, right, going in and, and doing it. And if you need to give them some extra time or whatever, I have no problem doing that too. So I always do the force completion. I do set the timer also. If you don't set the timer, then um, then what happens is even though you may want them to take only an hour with it, they can continue and work on it after the timer is all set, uh, is, is expired. So I set the timer for 60 minutes or 50 minutes if it's a 50 minute class. And then auto submit, I put on. Usually I do 60 minutes. Okay, even if it's a 50 minute class, but then I'll tell them, 
if you have to go to class, your next class, please go, you know, because I don't like to hold them over the time. And then auto submits on, so this way we'll submit it as much as they did at that 60 minute uh, time limit. And then here's where you display it. Okay, so I, I'm gonna display this only during the class time, which if it's my first quiz, it takes place on 831. So I'll display this on 831. And again, I think it's from 1.30 p.m. Okay, to 2.20. Hopefully I selected p.m. in my last one. I'll go back and check to make sure. And don't worry, if you select p.m. instead of a.m., they will let you know that it's not there. Okay, and then the password. Um, I don't give a password if it's fully online. I do give a password if it's in class. Okay. And then the due date is 8.31 at 2.20. Again, if you have someone that cannot take the quiz at this time, okay, if they have a, uh, a sporting event or whatnot, then don't check this because you want them to be able to take it at a later time, okay? And then I, after all attempts are graded, I show them the submitted answer, I show them my feedback, and again, this one you can check or not check. It just shows if it's incorrect or not. Do not show, check correct unless you actually want them to see that correct answer. I do all at once and I don't randomize. And that's it. So now the quiz is going to be available to students after August 31st at, at 1.30. And, um, and then when they're done taking the quiz, it's the same thing as I do for my in-class assignment. I come in here and, and I grade it. Okay, and I do take a little more time, of course, grading quizzes than the in-class assignments. Okay, um, the next, the last thing I want to cover, I know I'm going kind of long here, but sometimes, you know, you may, you want to use the questions that the publishers give you. So you say, you know what, my questions are, my quizzes are multiple choice, and I like to go with the publisher questions. Okay, if that's the case, then I'll show you quickly how we can do that. Now, most teachers will give you the questions um, inside of the learning platform. The problem with that is, especially if it's online, it's very easy to cheat. Okay, keep in mind if you're using publisher questions that um, you can easily find them online. Okay, even though they will claim that they check and make sure their questions aren't online, they're all online. It's very easy for a student to take the questions and answers and put it online. Um, I have a, uh, oh, that's my calendar. Okay, never mind. Okay, so, so anyway, most of these platforms will have the instructor companion site, which will give you the um, test banks. Okay. So, so, oops, looks like I'm hearing someone. And I don't know, Chris, is that you that I hear? Because I thought yeah. I muted everyone's mic. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I totally clicked it on. Okay. All right. So this is, uh, I'll go ahead and accept this. Okay. Now, we use Blackboard here. Um, some universities use Canvas, some use Moodle, right? These are all different LMSs that are available and they usually have test banks for all. I'm going to download the Blackboard one. So I'm gonna right click, save link as, and I'll just put it on my desktop for now. Notice it is a zip file. So you will need to come in and unzip it. So let's say, Oops, where's my extract? Here we go, extract all. Okay, so here is now the file extracted. Here's my question sets. They have one for each chapter. Now these are gonna be zipped too. Do not unzip these. 
you need to it needs to be in the zip format for blackboard to be able to import them into blackboard okay so don't unzip the chapter questions okay so now i'm going to go into blackboard and i'm just going to week one and i'll go ahead and create a test oh first i have to i'm sorry first i have to import it so i'm going to go into my um course tools again i'm going to go to test surveys and pools now these are pools of questions okay so i'm going to click on pools and i'm going to say import pool so remember before i built a pool you build a pool if they're your own questions if they're the publisher questions you import the pool i'm going to say browse my computer i'm going to go into the chapter i want to import i'll just go ahead and import chapter five lists and dictionaries i'll say open just keep in mind it is still in the zip format here i will hit submit and it's saying that the package has been processed if there's an error with the importing it will tell you here okay otherwise it's just going to say the package has been processed i think you get an email too saying that the it's been imported here is the here are the questions chapter five lists and dictionaries there are 50 of them you can go in and you can edit them if you want to see them. So you can see there's a bunch of true false here and some multiple choice and some multiple answer as well. So there's no essays. So this is not a quiz that I would give, but you know, I know uh, some instructors like to give the multiple choice quizzes. So here's all the questions here. And now what I can do is I can build a test just like I did previously. And I'll just call this multiple choice quiz. Submit. And I'm going to do reuse question. Now you could do create question set if you want to use all 50 of them. Or you could do create random block. Okay. I'm going to select chapter five. Now what type of questions do you want? Now I just said all pool questions with my own because all of mine were essay. But since we have three different types of questions and you may say, you know what, I don't like giving true or false. I just want to give the multiple choice ones. Click multiple choice. There are 21 questions. OK. And by the way, in, if you want to delete some of them, if you don't like them, when you go into your pools and you click on the edit like I just did, you can go in and delete the ones you don't want. Okay, so I have 20 questions here and you say, you know what, I'd rather only 20 questions or maybe you just want to give 10. Hey, I want to ask 10 questions from chapter five and I'm going to make them 10 points each, that's good. And the nice thing about the random block is everyone's going to get 10 different questions. Okay, so they can't cheat off of each other. We click OK, click Submit. And then here is where you can set up your quiz settings as we just did. Okay, I'm going to hit submit. And if you click on it, you will see it exactly the way the student does. Okay, now the problem with publisher questions is they are all online, as I mentioned before. So students usually will do something like this if they don't know the answer and they didn't study. And look at this right here, right? Test two, here's Python chapter five flashcard quiz. And here's all the questions and answers. Okay, so what you want, wh one thing I would suggest if you are using multiple choice questions in an online format, use the Respondus Lockdown Browser, which I'll show next class. That will make sure that students do not open up another tab or browser and search for the answer. Uh, you can also use the monitoring feature, which I'll show next workshop. That will make sure that the student doesn't go and go to their phone and look up the answer. Okay, so um, that's what you have to know. I still use those features, even though I create my own questions, because I've learned that even though I create my own, there's nothing nothing to stop a you know, student from paying someone to go in and take it for them which is very common in online classes, not necessarily at Stetson, but just in general. Students taking online classes will sometimes not even take the class and have others go in and do their quizzes and exams for them. So I'll show how to prevent that in the next workshop. 
Okay, so I know I went a long time here. It was a lot to show, but I'm go ahead and open it up for any questions that you may have. And I know, Chris, you're going to go ahead and paste those here. Okay, how do we access the data regarding tracking the views? Okay, um, that's a good question. So if you track the views, then what happens is, um, and I can do that. So let me go into my assignment here. That's fine. So this is my in-class assignment. Oops. Did I put it in here? No. Where was it? I thought it was here. Oh, I can't remember where I created it now. Oh, 510. Okay. Oh, it was a homework. I'm sorry about this. Okay, it was a homework assignment. Here it is, 510. Okay, so I'm going to edit this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to track the number of views. I think that was the question. Yeah, tracking the views. Okay, so I click that. I click submit. And then what happens is it will say enable statistics tracking. And what you can do is you can click on the drop down here and you can say view um, statistics report. And what this will do now, I don't know if this will actually show anything because, of course, nobody saw it, but you can click run. Right. So what I did is I said view statistics report and then I came down here and I clicked run. OK. And then it gives you a report. Oh, here we go. All right, so it says select the format, PDF, select the dates that you want. So if you want to see who saw it today, you can do that. Select the users. I think it's all users by default. Okay, hit submit. And it's building this PDF. And it does take a little time to build this. Here it is. Here's my report. All right. So here's all my students. Now, of course, nobody spent any time in it because if nobody saw it yet. I didn't even open the course. But if I did, if they did, you'd be able to see, right? And I think these numbers are minutes. How many minutes they spent in there? And what time of the day? It gives you a little chart. Again, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't really use this that much. but. Um, but this is basically the rundown of your statistics tracker. So, you know, you can go in here and say, you know, look, this homework was open all week and I see you didn't even do it until the last day in the last hour. You know, because sometimes I may say, oh, you know, can I get some extra time? Well, you had all week to do it. You had two weeks to do it, right? Why did you wait to the last day and now you want extra time? So this is a way you can do that. Okay, so that hopefully answers that question. Uh, how are you dealing with hybrid class if students are at different time zones? This, that's a very good question. Okay, I have some students in Europe and Asia I'm aware of, yep, and I'm expiring quizzes before, okay. So I had that problem last semester. I had a student that was in Europe and he went to, um, to Europe after the campus was in, uh, locked down. And when I was given the quizzes, it was very late um, in his time zone. Um, how did I handle that? I, th I think what I ended up doing in that case is I did make it open all day for all students. And um, again, my quizzes are OK to do that because Everyone gets those different questions that I was talking about. Um, and yeah, you could have a student take it earlier and send their questions to that student. So like I said, my questions are very similar. And um, if they know you're giving different questions, you know, it may help them a little bit. But, you know, Unfortunately, no really way, there's no way, to, at least that I know of, to avoid that. Blackboard doesn't say, have an easy way to say, hey, you know, make it available at this student at a different time. Um, so 
another thing you could do is you can say, hey, what time would you like to take it? What US time would you like to take it in? You know, again, that's still not stopping a student from taking it early and giving it to them, but you can reassign it at a different time. So for instance, if I go into quiz one, if you go to edit the test options, you, and this is what you have to do, by the way, if a student misses a quiz and they need to retake it or they need to make it up. If you come down here to test availability exceptions and say add user or group, you select a student that needs that different time and hit submit. And then you can go ahead and select the availability for that particular student. So I know that's not the best solution, but that's one way of doing it. And if you do that, by the way, make sure, this is important, make sure that the checkbox here is unchecked because otherwise that student's gonna be able to go, is gonna go in and say, hey, I, I can't take this quiz because it's past the, the original due date. So make sure this is unchecked. Can I make two questions using the same pool? Uh, is there a possibility that the question would be repeated? No. So um, what you can do is you could go into your quiz options, edit, go to edit the test. And then in here where it says number of questions to display, just say two questions. So this way, if you have a pool of three questions, but you only want the student to see two of them, just say two. And then the student will get two different questions from a pool of three. And again, you have more chance of overlapping here with other students, of course. But still, not every student is going to get the same two questions. Okay. So, uh, so hopefully that answers that question. Any others? Um, at this time, I do not see any. OK. All right. Now, again, I know I went through a lot today, and um, it's a lot to grasp. You could watch the video once it becomes available. But also, um, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I have no issues meeting anyone on a one-to-one -one basis, or even if you want me to meet with your department. Um, I can do that, okay? Um, and okay, you're welcome. Now, another thing is I was going to, okay, Heather's not here. I wanted Heather to, if you use McGraw-Hill and you're not sure how to, if you use Pierce in my lab, I can help you with that integration. If you use McGraw-Hill, uh, Heather Evans Anderson um, is, an, is an expert with McGraw-Hill integration. So please reach out to her. She said she'd be happy to help anyone integrate their McGraw Hill classes with Blackboard. The videos will be posted in the Brown Center uh, blog, which will link to YouTube. And I think Chris, you'll go ahead and send out an email once they're available on the yeah. blog, right? Okay. I'll go ahead and show you all actually, if you would like real quick, where all okay. of that would go. Because I, I saw okay, people so me Let me stop about. sharing my screen. Yeah. And I can um, even stop the recording too. Yeah, go ahead. 